Good morning. We're going to get started. We are going to finish Chapter 13. This is our last lecture, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I apologize that the podcast for the IR spectroscopy came up so late. I've, I've been working on it for two days. I had a lot of technical difficulties, things not working out, using other people's systems, so I couldn't do it earlier. And it's actually pretty complicated to do that. So those are up. And what I'm going to be doing on the final is asking you a pretty simple question on IR spectroscopy. So um, it will benefit you to, um, to the, certainly to look through the, the podcast. IR spectroscopy is very easy. I consider NMR really difficult. So um, it's, it's helpful to be able to look through that. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to ask you a really simple question. There is also a podcast on um, calculating units of unsaturation. I'm not going to ask you to calculate units of unsaturation on the final. Okay, so I know they probably covered, talked about that in the review. I'm not asking, going to ask you to do it. I will show you how to do it at the end of class using a simple formula. You will need it next quarter. You will need IR next quarter. So those podcasts will stay up for you when you need them. We actually do units of unsaturation in chapter 10. So if you're in my class next quarter, you, I, you don't need to know that until chapter 10. All right, questions, anybody? If you've seen my old tests around, you will see, you'll see questions where I give you an unknown compound, I give you the molecular formula, I give you the IR, I give you the carbon, I give you the NMR, and I ask you to figure out what the compound is. That's how I normally test on spectroscopy. Um, but this is different. We've moved this chapter forward. Students usually have a chance to um, do their, uh, their unknowns lab in, in the lab where you have to do that same, very same thing for many compounds, so you have practice doing that. You don't have practice doing that, so I'm not going to be testing you like that. Okay, so you will not have to do one of those unknowns on the final. There will be, certainly be questions on NMR, but it won't be as difficult as that. That's sort of the ultimate task is you get a molecular formula and spectra and you figure out what the compound is. You will be required to do that next quarter and you will be required to do that in lab. Okay, so you have all the material that you need to do that. It's just too late in the game for me to ask you to step it up to that level. Okay, so I'm to, I want to be fair about it. Are there questions before we finish up chapter 13? Anybody? Yes. So if we finish the sapling, that's good enough to know what we should expect on the For, um, yeah, and, and sapling has some unknowns at the end that are that higher level. You don't, if you don't want to do them, you don't have to do them. So let's, you know, you don't have to finish everything in chapter 13. I mean, I think it's good to go back and do that when you have the lab. But yes, if you can do sapling, you'll be totally fine on the test. You had a question? Yeah. I'll let you guys know. I haven't finished the test yet, so I think I have to think about that. Yeah, maybe not. You maybe won't need it. We'll see. All right, more questions. Every, everybody knows about the review tonight? I, it's a, I'm sorry it's so rainy today. It makes it kind of hard to get around. But All right, I realized when I was, as, as I was lecturing last time, I realized I never finished the previous page. This would be Monday's page, and I never finished it. So at the very bottom of page 178, let's go back to that. All right, so we're talking about protons attached to heteroatoms are very highly variable and sometimes absent. They're sort of all over the place. And you could take, you could take ethanol and you could take it in two different solvents and the OH peak would be in different places on the spectrum. So it's, very, it's highly unpredictable. The, they often look like this. They're much broader than normal, but that's not always the case. You can, it can also be a sharp peak. But very often it's a broad peak and that should hopefully stand out at you. There's a couple of problems in sapling where they say, uh, you know, here's your NMR and if you shake this with D2O, um, the that this is what happens, the peak goes away. That means that you have an alcohol, okay? So what happens when you shake with D2O? 
Um, by the way, remember, NMR is for, for um, nuclei with odd mass numbers. So deuterium has an even mass number, so it's completely invisible in the NMR. The NMR can't see it. So that's why we use solvents with deuterium. And you can imagine if you have an alcohol and you add deuterium and you shake it up, some of the deuterium, the, the, the uh, deuterium is going to be transferred to the alcohol. It's going to start passing that deuterium around and so the peak will disappear. So that's what they're talking about. So this, this is very solvent dependent. So let's write here, depends on solvent used. Also depends on concentration. So you could use the, you could take ethanol and you could change the concentration using the same solvent and the, the hydrogen bonded to the oxygen will appear at a different region of the spectrum. Hydrogen bonding is deshielding. So are you using a solvent that can do, that can engage in hydrogen bonding with your alcohol? That also has, a, has an effect. So we have some ranges here and these are included on your list of peaks for a proton NMR. So 0.5 all the way to 5, but don't be surprised if you have something going beyond 5. That would be common. So phenol, so an alcohol attached to a benzene ring, 5 to 8 tends to be a little higher, but don't be surprised if it falls out of that range. And then a hydrogen bonded to a, the oxygen of a carboxylic acid, very high up, 9 to 12. All right, so that's everything we wanted to say on that page. So let's jump 10 pages to uh, page 188. All right, and here's where we're talking about a signal that's split by two or more different kinds of protons with similar coupling constants. So um, what we're talking about right here We'll call this, these protons C, we'll call these B, and we'll call these A. And so right here is HA, here is HB, and here is HC. And if you look here, if we're looking at the B protons and how the B protons are going to be split, they're split by these two carbons, here, these two hydrogens here on this side and these three on that side those two hydrogens are not the same as those. Okay, so we would expect this to be split into three on this side, so a triplet, and then into four on this side, so a triplet of quartets. If you look here at this peak though, it, what it looks like is it's, it, it looks like we've been, we, we just split B by um, these three hydrogens all added together, so three, four, five, so it would be split into six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it looks like it's being split equally, right? Like they're all the same. They really aren't the same, but it looks like we're just say adding these neighbors together, three and two, that's five, so it would be split into six or n plus one. Okay, and so that's what it looks like. But if you, if you actually take this, that, and that's a 60 megahertz instrument, by the way, but if you actually take this on a higher, instru higher field instrument, this one is a 500 megahertz, you can see that it is not split into six here. Okay, it's actually, you can see the more complicated splitting here. And we'd have to go a little higher still even to see that a little better. So um, just wanted to make you, be, make you aware of that. All right, so how to interpret a proton NMR spectrum. Let's, this is right here. Evaluate units of unsaturation as for IR from the molecular formula. I'm going to talk about units of unsaturation at the end. If you have an IR of the compound, analyze the IR spectrum to determine functional groups. So that's what we use IR spectroscopy for is determine, to, to determine functional groups. So you want to do those, these two things first. And then once you start looking at the NMR, you want to look for major features first before worrying about details. So consider the following. Broad singlets are usually due to hydrogen's bond to oxygen or nitrogen. Okay, so I'm talking about something that looks like that. We just got through talking about that. That's on page 178. 
So um, often broad. So if you see a broad singlet in your spectrum, you, it would tip you off that you have a hydrogen bonded to oxygen or nitrogen. Absorption is around three or four are typical for hydrogens on carbons bonded to electronegative groups such as halogens or oxygen. Okay, so all of these hydrogens right here are going to fall in that range. Absorption is from about 2.1 to 2.5 usually mean you have protons adjacent to a carbonyl. Okay, so if you have just a methyl from a ketone, this is a chemical shift 2.1 and that would be a singlet because there are no neighbors. When you have longer chains here, this is going to move up higher. So these guys right here, 2.5, right here, 2.7. And what would be the splitting on this middle one? What would be the splitting for this peak here? Well, we've got three neighbors. Remember, N plus one rule, it's going to be split into a quartet. Okay. What about this one here? Septet. It's got six neighbors, so it would be split into a septet. So that's what that would look like. A sharp singlet at 2.5 is consistent with a proton on a terminal alkyne. So this proton right here, chemical shift 2.5. All right, so we're, we're, we're just picking out broad features where it's until before we get down to the nitty gritty. Absorptions from around 9 to 10 are consistent with an aldehyde proton. Usually looks like a singlet. An aldehyde is a very small coupling constant with protons on the carbon adjacent to the aldehyde, so the peak can often appear as a singlet, especially if the NMR is taking it on a lower field instruments. When you get into 500, 600, 700 megahertz, you will see splitting, uh, but this is typically going to be a singlet even though it has two neighbors because the coupling constant is so very small. Absorptions around 7 to 8 are typical for hydrogens bonded to aromatic rings. So approximately 7.3. If you have an electron withdrawing group, so this is um, electron withdrawing group. This can be higher than 8. If you have an electron donating group, so this EDG is for electron donating group. Um, then this could be lower than seven. So there's a page in chapter 14 that we skipped. Um, I have scanned that page. That is also online under your practice and that talks about this a little bit more in depth. And you'll need that information for your lab next quarter. Absorptions between 5 and 6 are consistent with vinyl protons. So that's what we're looking for, these guys right here. Typically complicated splitting, doublets of doublets. We talked about that when we talked about styrene. So these guys here, usually five to six. If you have electron withdrawing groups or electron donating groups attached, that's going to change and that's also part of that page that we skipped. That is now, um, it's, it's already been scanned, filled in um, on, under the practice link. If you have other peaks at f between five and six, it also can mean that you have multiple electron with, um, withdrawing groups. So 5.47 and for this and these hydrogens here attached to two oxygens, 5.61. So in this five, point six, five to six range, vinyl protons or protons on carbons that have uh, multiple electron withdrawing groups attached. 
And vinyl groups can be moved significantly downfield when electron withdrawing groups are bonded to the pi system. So here this would be 6.43, 6.05, and very powerful electron withdrawing group nitro, 6.55, and all the way 7.12. So we're already, we're, we're going all the way into the aromatic region here when we have a nitro group attached. So these are not numbers that you need to memorize, these are just some general things to look for. And then you want to look for common splitting patterns. All right, so common splitting patterns. This is an ethyl signal. This is A, this is B, this is A, this is B. So you have a quartet that's downfield of a triplet and um, that should jump right out at you as an ethyl signal. This is um, an isopropyl signal. So we have a um, here, this is A, this is B. We have a doublet and then we have this, this here which should be seven peaks but very often these outlying ones here are missing. So it might be less than seven. But it integrates, we'll put the integrals down below. This integrates one to six and this one integrates two to three here. So these are the integrals on this line. Those are some common splitting patterns. Also, we have um, hydrogens on adjacent carbons. These little squiggly lines, is where these are attached to something else that doesn't have protons. So we just have these guys splitting each other. And so this would be a, this would be a one to one ratio. And we have A, HA, HB, HA, HB. And then we also have the same thing here when we have a CH2 next to a CH2, so two methylenes. This is, integrates to two and this integrates to two. So depending on the groups attached, one will be further downfield. We'll just call this guy A and this one B. We'll call this guy A and this one B. All right, so um, and then after you've done all of the looking at those major features, now you can get down to the details, look at the relative integrations to determine how many kinds of hydrogens there are, correlate hydrogens with diagnostic hydrogens listed in the table given, and then propose structures and then correlate the splitting patterns with the structures. So you always want to have a couple of structures that you're working with and then you see if it matches everything there and then you can usually pick out the correct structure. All right, so that's proton NMR. Are there any questions before we talk very briefly about carbon NMR? Anybody? Yes? So when you have a, say a triplet of doublets, does it matter if you say that or a doublet of triplets? It does not matter. Yeah, not to me anyway. All right, carbon 13. Any nucleus with a spin number of one half can be used studied by NMR spectroscopy. So, nucleus of carbon 13 has a spin number of one half just like hydrogen. The natural abundance of carbon 13 is only 1%. So, there's a huge sensitivity problem with carbon. A carbon NMR is expected to be about 1% as intense as a proton NMR spectrum. So um, in order to take a carbon NMR, you need a more concentrated sample or you need to scan for much longer than you would for a proton. All right, so let's talk about some principles of carbon-13. It's, it's, it's actually a lot easier than proton NMR. So principles basically the same but some aspects are unique. Number one. What's unique, coupling between carbons is generally not observed. Well, that's helpful. That's going to make it a lot simpler for us, right? When we don't couple, we don't have coupling to worry about. So we don't have our peak split. And the reason is, is that if we look at just any carbon here, there is a 1% chance of this carbon being um, carbon-13 because the natural abundance of carbon-13 is 1%. So there's a 1% chance of that being carbon-13. So the odds are 1 in 100. The probability of two carbons having, being carbon-13 in this molecule 
of two carbons in the same molecule being carbon 13 is 1 over 100, the odds for one over the odds for another one, and that's 1 in 10,000. So it's rare. It happens, but it's rare. And if we are already having trouble seeing something that has a natural abundance of 1%, we're certainly not going to see something where it's 1 in 10,000. Okay, that's just not, it's not something that we're going to be able to observe. Range of chemical shift is also very large compared to proton NMR. We go all the way from 1 to above 200. And if you compare this to a proton NMR, we go from 0 to about 10. We'll go above 10 um, sometimes, but we generally speaking, we go from 0 to 10. So it's a much larger range. This is our chart for where things happen in a carbon NMR spectrum. So this will be um, provided for you for the final. Coupling between carbon and hydrogens does occur. This presents its own problems. Typical coupling constants are very large, 20 to 120 hertz. That's huge for directly attached protons, but longer range coupling is also observed. So protons on carbons 1 and 2 and 3 carbons away can also cause splitting. So uh, it would be terribly messy if we allowed this to happen. We're actually going to do away with this coupling, but let's talk about what that would look like if we allowed it. Split into a quartet by the three attached hydrogens. Plus a smaller coupling. from the two adjacent carbons plus coupling from nine hydrogens, three carbons over. So this would be a mess and impossible for us to figure out what was going on. So uh, the, NM, the carbon NMRs are run in such a way um, they're run as proton decoupled to simplify the analysis and this is called spin-spin decoupling and it gets rid of this carbon-hydrogen coupling called spin-spin decoupling. So we don't have any splitting at all in the carbon NMR. We have a single peach peak for every unique carbon. There's no splitting there's no integrals. So it's much, much simpler. So we don't integrate, we don't have, we don't have splitting. We're going to get a single peak carbon peak for every unique carbon. We're going to, for this class, we're going to rely on two features of carbon-13 NMR to solve structures. Um, the first is the number of signals. Gives the number of different types of carbon atoms in a molecule. The number of, let's just say, unique carbon atoms in a molecule. That's feature number one. Feature number two is the chemical shifts of these signals. gives information about the environment of each carbon. Just like proton NMR. So here's a sample problem. How many lines are observed in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of the following compound? Which carbon signal would be the furthest downfield? So if we count unique carbons, well, well, I'll just put numbers here. This is one, two, the carbonyl is a carbon, has a carbon, one, two, three. This is four, 
And these two guys are identical. So this would be five. So a uh, number of unique carbons is five, so therefore we will have five signals. Which is the furthest downfield? Let's go back and look at our chart here. What you're going to see is that um, we have alkanes down here, we have carbons bonded to halogens higher, we have carbon bonded to oxygen. So similar to proton NMR, carbons that are part of a carbon-carbon triple bond, carbon-carbon double bond, aromatic, the ones that are the furthest downfield are the carbonyls. Okay, so if there's a carbonyl, that's going to be the one that's the furthest downfield. So that's the same here. Furthest downfield is going to be the carbonyl carbon. And that's about all we're going to be doing with carbon NMR. Just to show you what a carbon NMR looks like compared to a proton NMR, that's on the, the last page of our notes. <coughs> So as you can see with cholesterol, we have a lot of um, carbon-hydrogen bonds that are very similar chemical shift, very similar coupling constants, and so it gets extremely complicated like this. And th this would not be a spectrum I would ever give you to study. Okay, so this would not be something I would give you. Very complicated. Um, only somebody who had studied spectroscopy um, very well would be able to do that. So the, 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 the grad students here, they take a spectroscopy class and they spend the whole quarter talking about spectroscopy and they go very in depth. And then um, on Saturday, Saturday of, is it this Saturday? This Saturday. Or the Saturday of finals week, they come in and they take a 12 hour final. And they're given things that look like this and they have to figure out what it is. And so they get to, you know, they get up to, they can get up and go to the bathroom and they can do, you know, whatever, they can, they can go eat lunch, but they're not, they're not supposed to talk about it and they don't and that's the, their 12 hour final. So um, the first year grad students have to suffer through that. Um, so I guess that, that would be the worst final ever, right? All right, I wanna say, I want to say uh, something about um, uh, units of unsaturation, degrees of unsaturation, and there's a, like a 10 minute podcast that goes a little bit more in depth, but um, if we have, so just take a piece of paper off, you can write it on the bottom here, units of unsaturation. also known as degrees of unsaturation. Also known as unsaturation number. These are all terms that are used in, uh, interchangeably. And, and, and really, it, it's going to help you do your sapling chapter 14 assignment. So we do need to talk about it. I will not be asking you um, to do this on a test. But if we have a saturated hydrocarbon, we have the maximum number of hydrogens per carbon. And the, and the formula that, this, that, that the molecular formula would fit into is CnH2n plus 2. So let me give you an example. A three carbon chain, is, that's a saturated hydrocarbon. We have one, two, three carbons. So this would be C3. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight is the maximum number of hydrogens for three carbons, and so that's a saturated hydrocarbon. When we add an unsaturation, 
unsaturated hydrocarbons. We add a ring or a pi bond. Have ring or pi bond. All right, so let me give you an example. Take that same three carbon chain and now put a double bond there. Now if you count carbons, there's three carbons. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. There's six hydrogens. So you see we've dropped two hydrogens. It's unsaturated. So we have um, two less hydrogens. than um, an, a saturated hydrocarbon. We also do the same thing when we make a ring. So if I took those three carbons and I put them into a ring, that's C3, and then we have two, four, six hydrogens. So also two less. So when we, get, when we have a ring or a double bond, then we have a, uh, an, an unsaturated hydrocarbon. If we do, let's do a ring and a double bond. That's C3H4, isn't it? One, two, three, four. So we would say for this molecule, there's one unsaturation. This one has one unsaturation. This one has two. So, um, or we could say this has one degree of unsaturation or saturation number of one. This one has, um, this one also has that. This has two degrees of unsaturation or an unsaturation number of one. All those uh, terms are used interchangeably. And, and what it does is when we, when we know the, the, the saturation number, the degrees of unsaturation, it allows us to very quickly draw several possible structures for a molecule. You, if you remember back to, um, chapter one when they said draw five examples of something in the C5H10 and you were like you spent all your time counting carbons, right? You, and, and, and so it took you a long time. If you know the unsaturation number, then that's going to be a really easy job for you. So C5H10, let's do C5H8. We'll do C5H8. Now I show you a method that I usually use um, and, and that's in the podcast. You don't have necessarily have to watch the podcast because I'm pretty much covering most of it. But um, if this was saturated, it would be C5H what? It has to fit this formula here, H12. So we are short by uh, four hydrogens. So therefore, we have two unsaturations. Every time we drop two hydrogens, we add an unsaturation. So we have two unsaturations. So now, if I had, if I had you draw, give me an example of something that would fit that. I could draw a five-membered ring with a double bond. I could draw something like that, two double bonds. I could draw something with one, two, three, four, five, five carbons. I could draw that. Wouldn't that be a six ring? Oh, I, I need a five member ring, yes. Sorry about that. Let's go like that. Thank you. I could do this. One, two, three, four, five. I could do a four membered ring. I could do a three membered ring. Now, how long would it have taken you to draw these in chapter one? You would have to be counting carbons and all that kind of stuff. And I don't have to count carbons because if I have the right number of unsaturations, I have the right number of heart carbons. So this is very useful when you're trying to come up with potential structures when you're trying to solve an unknown using spectroscopy. So um, there's a formula that is not in your book that I'm going to give you. I don't use this formula myself, but um, it's a really helpful formula to use. And, ah, uh, let's see. I'm, gonna, I'm out of space on this transparency, so I'm going to put it on the bottom of page 193. So I'll take this off here. Here's the formula. U equals, so U for unsaturation number, 2C plus 2 plus N minus X minus 
hydrogen. And this is also on the podcast. There's also a handout that goes with the podcast that's online. So C is the number of carbons, N is the number of nitrogens, X is the number of halogens. And then you divide that whole thing by two. So if we have C8, H9NO, for example, U equals 2 times 8 plus 2 plus 1 nitrogen minus 0, there's no halogens, minus 9 hydrogens divided by 2. And if you calculate that, you get 5, 5 unsaturations. So I um, just want to give you a little hint. If you have a large number of unsaturations and a small number of carbons, think benzene ring, okay? Don't try to draw things with triple bond, double bond, triple bond, double bond. Usually doesn't work out. Um, I'm going to think benzene ring. So let me give you one possible structure here. How many units of unsaturation do we have for a benzene ring? Four. Four. So I'm almost there. I need one more. That's six carbons. I'm going to add two more carbons. And then um, I need, yeah, I, I like carbonyl here. I also have a nitrogen. So it looks, that's, my, that's one possible structure. Okay, or you could have, you could have done something like this. I'll just put in NH2 here. And then um, I could have something like that. And notice I don't have to take the time to count carbons at all. I could, let's count carbons here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's going, to be, it's going to be the right number if you have the right number of carbons and the units of unsaturation. So that's very helpful and handy technique if you need to calculate units of unsaturation, which is going to help for you to be finishing the sapling assignment for Chapter 14. Questions on unsaturation number? Anybody? Yes? Can you do another example? I'm still lost. You're still lost? OK. Um, I'm just out of space. <laughs> I should have brought more transparencies. Let's see, maybe I have one down here. No, I don't have one down there. OK, maybe I have one in here. Hang on. I do. Look at that. OK. So let's do, let's do C, C7H8. O2. Okay? We're going to calculate units of unsaturation. So 2 times 7 plus 2. There's no nitrogen, so that's 0. There's no halogens, that's 0. And we're going to subtract the number of hydrogens, that's 8 and divide that whole thing by 2. So 7 and 7 is 14, 15, 16, 24 divided by 2 is, no, did I say that right? 7, 7 is 14, 15, 16, 24 divided by 2. That's, it's minus 8. Minus eight. Okay, so what's my unsaturation number? 4. Okay, that's better. That was too many. Um, definitely, if you get, <laughs> I've had people on the test that for something like that, they calculate 365 on saturation. So you know you've made a mistake, right? All right, so now we want to draw some potential structures here. So we just need seven carbons. That's four on saturations. We could have a benzene ring. That would be four, four on saturations. Could do that. And then I have two oxygens. So let me see. I'm going to put an OH here. CH2, OH. Is that good? That's a possibility. I could also do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a ketone. Or carboxylic acid. There's one unsaturation, there's another. So unsaturations are double bonds or rings. That's only two, right? So I need two more. 
Goodness. Okay. <laughs> That's if I don't have a ring. One, two, three, four unsaturations. Did you guys get the idea? <coughs> Any other questions? Yes? The ring is one unsaturation and each double bond is one, two. So it's four altogether. Is that good? Did you, you, did you see it now? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a good point. Make sure you count your number of carbons. <coughs> All right, yeah? How come the oxygens don't account, don't make a change in the uh, unsaturated number? How come the oxygens don't make a change in the unsaturation number? Mm. Well, because they don't. So, like, for example, Let's do this and let's do this. Okay? This is uh, C3H123456788. This is uh, C, let's do C3 again, okay? So I'll make that three carbons. One, two, three, C3, H, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you see what I mean? Nitrogen changes it because it changes the number of hydrogen. So, for example, let's, let's now do one with nitrogen. Three carbons and, and let's do NH2. All right, so that's one, two, three, C3, H, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It adds a hydrogen. So that's why we have to subtract a nitrogen. And so let's do one with a halogen. You'll see why we have that. Let's do one with a halogen. That's C3H, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See how that chlorine took a place of a hydrogen. So that's where we get this from. So if you forget how this works, um, you can always go back to sample things like this to see what's going on. All right, we will um, stop right there. If you have individual questions, you can come on up. I will see you again at discussion and I'll see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.